Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. I was down in Tampa, Florida not too long ago for a Legatus meeting. Legatus is an organization of Catholic chief executives that get together to encourage one another in the faith. It was actually founded right here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we're actually doing the taping. Uh, the national headquarters is here, and our offices are just down the hallway from them. But anyway, when I was down in Tampa, I met this amazing couple, Dr. Frank and Rose Averill, and I said, would you be willing to be on our television program, The Choices We Face? And they said, yes. So here they are, and we're so happy to have you here, Dr. Frank and Rose, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much, it's our pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, you're probably wondering why I invited them to be here. Well, they are Christians. They are joyful Christians. They are Christians that are open to the Holy Spirit. And Dr. Frank and Rose are jointly running an incredible medical center called St. Francis Medical Center. And one of the things that really caught my attention is that they have a chapel there and they have staff prayer there. And so they're really trying to bring the Christian witness and Christian spirit right into the middle of this medical facility. But before we talk about that, let's talk about you. This, you know, like you were born and then what happened? <laughs> That's, that brings it and back. Let Frank go first because okay. I know that you're not going to be at a loss for words. <laughs> and we want Frank to kind Very of true. have a chance too. I think my story uh, begins. I grew up in New York City, uh, Queens. Me too, uh, the Bronx. All right, Queens. Oh. Um, but uh, I grew up in a traditional Irish Catholic family. Uh, you know, I was blessed with great parents. I have uh, five siblings, so there's six of us, so a, a traditional Catholic family. We attended Mass every Sunday, um, but I always kind of yearned for more. I had the, the good fortune to go to parochial schools, uh, elementary, and then Archbishop Malloy High School in Queens. Um, but I always had a, a yearning to, to be more active in the faith. And through the years, I always practiced my faith but mainly was what I would call a Sunday Catholic. Uh, would go to Mass on Sunday, but wasn't more involved in that until I had a experience, really. I had a yearning uh, throughout my professional career as a doctor to really, you know, try to maybe go to daily Mass because, you know, I really felt that, you know, the Eucharist was the focus of our faith, and I, I yearned to really have a daily uh, re receiving of the Eucharist, but professionally, my my career seemed chaotic. I would always get paged. Uh, the beep would go off in the middle of, of mass. And so I think part of that, but part of it was my unwillingness to take that next step. Um, and that obstacle was taken away from me on a, a pilgrimage when we went uh, to Lourdes. Mm -hmm. So it was funny. I had a premonition before we went, that something was going to happen at Lourdes. And I was kind of nervous of it. Um, and we were there for several days uh, in Lourdes, and I had avoided going to the baths the whole time, having a premonition that something was going to happen at <laughs> yeah. the, these baths. And the last day we were there, I had successfully avoided going there the whole time, and it was raining uh, quite torrentially at the time. So we sort of went around the grounds. And as we were sort of heading back towards the hotel, one of the, the women who was in the group with Rose and I said, well, why don't we, this is our last day, why don't we go to the baths? And I sort of res resigned myself, okay, let's go. So we walked over to the location where the baths are at Lord's, And I noticed there was this 
ridiculous line of people, at least a thousand people in line. Not being a particularly patient person, I thought this was my excuse. <laughs> yeah. There's too many people here to wait in the torrential right. rain. Yeah. <laughs> but then I looked at the line and I noticed something was peculiar about the line. There was only women in the line. And I, I said out loud, look at this line. Why do you notice it's unusual about it? And they lo all looked at me like I was nuts. They said, there's only women in the line. They said, well, there's two separate baths, one for the women, one for the men. Over there is the men's bath. There were only six men on line. <laughs> Isn't that the story of the Catholic Church? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I said, God, I was blessed by the kind of the flabby faith of the, the yeah. men in the Catholic faith. So he kind of took that one last excuse out of my uh, armatarium. So I got online, and also it was unbelievable because since there were so few people on the line, that part of the line was covered with an awning, so I didn't even get wet while I was waiting to go <laughs> into the bath. So when I went into the baths, the thing that was amazing to me was the kindness and the love of the volunteers. That, that hit me right off the bat. And then when I did enter the baths, I did get a, a, a spiritual awakening, a sense of overwhelming love, and I realized at that moment, at that time, I, I felt internally that God saying, I will take away that obstacle for you. And I knew immediately there was the obstacle of going to daily mass. Wow. And ever since that time, which is how many years? Uh, that was uh, Pentecost Sunday. Oh, that's the other 2013. thing. 2013. Wow. Well, so, so you know, eight years I've been going to daily mass and that obstacle has been taken away. And my, my phone, and back then it was Pedro and now it's a phone, uh, has never gone off once since that time. So I've been able to attend daily mass and that kind of put me on, I think, the super highway to grow in faith. Well, wow. right, would you tell them about what happened when you walked out of the baths? Oh, well, when I walked out of the baths and I felt like I was glowing. The other thing that's kind of miraculous about Lourdes, and I think I've heard many pe people experience this, is that you go in and you get plunged into the water and you come out and you're completely dry. And you have your clothes there and you put your clothes on and your clothes don't even get wet. So this is a kind of a very common experience. I had that experience as well. But I also had this incredible sense of glowing and love uh, encompassing me. So when I came out of the the baths, the women were still on line. In the rain. Maybe, you know, <laughs> uh, 900 place now, 100 people had gone in maybe. So they were going to have another two hours on line. So as I walked over them, Rose's back was to me, but the other women were there and they said, Rose, turn around. Your husband's glowing. Wow. He was. He's wow. visibly glowing. Wow. Well, so from that time forward, the Lord has kind of put me on this um, fast track to grow in my faith, which I feel is a blessing. You know, I'm not yeah. worthy to have received it, but I'm so grateful that I did receive yeah. that uh, that experience in Lord's, which has encouraged me to step out in my faith. And probably the culmination of that has been now I'm in the process of being ordained as a deacon mm. um, in um, October wow. of this year. And um, I don't think I, that would have happened without that experience. Yeah, well, that's really wonderful. Let's tell people a little bit about Lourdes because, you know, maybe some people watching us now wouldn't know that that is. But way back in the 19th century, I think 1859 or something like that, uh, a little girl named Bernadette in this little mountain village named Lourdes uh, began to see Mary. And, and Mary began to talk to her. And one of the things that she said is that as an act of humility, she she asked Bernadette to dig in the ground and, and a spring began to come out, but it was like muddy and dirty. And as an act of humility, Mary asked her to drink it, you know, and then that stream has been flowing ever since. And those are the waters that you went into. I was at Lord's once and I had a, a similar experience. I had already been awakened to the Lord, but uh yeah, it, it kind of takes a little bit of courage to go into the waters, doesn't it? You take your clothes off, you know, they're very modest and everything and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, you experience something like it, it's like a renewal of baptism or, you know, being reborn in a certain kind of way. And it's a, it's a real renewal experience. But uh, 
millions of people go there every year. So many people have been healed. So it's really a an, an enduring sign about the supernatural breaking into our world and, and, and the love of Mary for God's children and trying to bring us back to herself. So that's great, Frank. Thanks for sharing that. As a physician, it did touch me very much because you see all the people who are infirmed and crippled and the people taking them, the, 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 yeah. the charity that is expressed by the people wheeling yeah. them to the waters is beautiful. And I think Lord's, uh, exemplifies Mary's role so much is that she, and in my case too, um, I had this experience, but she led me to a deeper relationship with Jesus. And that's what Mary's goal is completely. But I think the story isn't complete until Rose had mentioned it was Pentecost uh, Sunday. And why don't you tell what, how you uh, were involved in, in the background? So in the background, first of all, on as a wife, and on, we've been together a very long time. How um, long have you been married? We've been married since 1985. Okay. We actually met in 1979. Okay. On, yeah. And so since that time, um, I have been praying that Frank would fall and live passionately in love with Christ. Mm. On, and before we went on this pilgrimage, on, I was not raised um, practicing the faith. My, children, my family did not go to church. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the... What was your maiden name? Fusillo. So you were Italian. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you were an Italian Catholic. <laughs> I was baptized Catholic yeah, and I had right. my communion. But there's, yeah. it, that's a lot of my story there. So okay. I'll, I'll get to that, okay. um, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but the uh, I had never played a novena. Um, and I really feel the Holy Spirit himself put on my heart to pray a novena while we were on this pilgrimage. Um, and I prayed the Pentecost novena. Hmm. And the prayers that I prayed was that um, Frank be reborn, he be renewed in the spirit. Hmm. And we had, as he said, no plans to um, go to the baths and Lourdes. Um, that was the last day of our pilgrimage. We started in Fatima, went to Lourdes. And when he came out and he walked towards us, um, one of the other women, as he said, uh, started, she took me by the shoulders and she started saying, he, your husband, your husband, he's glowing, he's glowing. Oh. And she turned me around and all the other women in that area, like he's glowing. And he came right up to me and he looked me right in the eyes and he said, I've been reborn. I'm renewed in the spirit. Wow. The exact words I'd been praying in that novena. Yeah. And he did not know I was praying that. No, did no. Yeah, it and happened to be Pentecost Sunday too. Yeah. <laughs> Must and, have been the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah, and the fruit, you know, was yeah. so obvious. He started attending daily mass and participating more in the mass, um, becoming an altar server and a reader, and mm. and and all those things yeah. during the mass as well. Yeah, for the sake of people who might not even know what a novena is, tell us what a novena is. That is uh, nine days of prayer on and. It's particularly uh, relevant because I think the Pentecost novena is the mm -hmm. first novena because the uh, the apostles were in the upper room for nine days praying. Yeah, that's so that's where the Holy that's, Spirit that's came. where that's where the idea for novena comes yeah. from. Yeah. Jesus says, "Stay in the city until he received power from on high." And so they stayed in the city. They prayed with Mary and the disciples for nine days, and Pentecost came. Yeah, well, that was great that you were praying for your husband like that. That's that's the key for a lot of wives, isn't it? Oh, a lot I, of wives are frustrated with their husbands, aren't they? Well, you know. <laughs> well, the prayers of a wife are very powerful. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of, of a wife, of a spouse, is for the salvation of, of, you know, that's why I feel my purpose is the salvation of his soul. Yeah. And that's how um, yeah. God can be used by God to impact yeah. the world. Good. Now, tell us about your story. All right, so yes, I'm from an Italian family. <laughs> yeah. um, my father immigrated here. Um, my mother's um, parents immigrated here. So I'm in essence, I'm a first generation American. Um, and yes, they were Catholic. Uh, my father's family actually converted to Church of God when they came into the United States. Okay. Um, my mother's family was Catholic. Um, but as time and they got married in the catholic church on 
and my oh, the youngest of five, uh, and, and the my other siblings did receive all of their sacraments. Um, by the time I came into the picture, there was less and less and less practice mm -hmm. going on, um, to the point where we really didn't even go to uh, to mass on Christmas or or Easter. Uh, and there was a lot of cooking and preparation to do, and that's what it was focused on. So on faith, um, religion wasn't really part of my life. I did have a, uh, my grandmother, my grandmother Rose, who I was named after, mm -hmm. and she lived with us. And um, she prayed the rosary. She had a room, she prayed mm -hmm. the rosary. She had um, a picture in her room of um, Jesus, the man of sorrows. Mm -hmm. on, and she had a statue of Mary in her room. Mm -hmm. So she had her faith. Yeah. but. And she didn't drive, so she never had the opportunity to go to Mass or take me mm -hmm. to Mass with her. And so I also was in a very broken state as a child. We, we were pretty poor at this point. Um, uh, there had been some things that had happened in my family. On, and I was actually, we were receiving some assistance. Sure. Um, and, uh, but there were other things that were... Um, not the happiest or yeah. Of, yeah. Um, situation. And um, I was so broken and alone mm -hmm. on that I um, didn't, for all practical purposes, did not speak. And I did not make eye contact with people. Yeah, no, I understand. Trauma can shut people down. Yeah. On, um, And I was also tormented at school. And yeah. I was the untouchable. Nobody would would sit with me at lunch. Um, I literally would have things like milk poured over my head. And um, I would hide in the bathroom and during recess, sitting, uh, squatting on top of the toilet so that the monitors wouldn't come and find me uh, because it was torturous. Yeah, wow, um, wow, wow. So in that- And you know, and this is not unusual. There's unfortunately a number of people who have these experiences, these circumstances growing up. And uh, I'm already thanking the Lord for what he's done to rescue from that. It's, and God always does over and beyond. Yeah. On like the story with my husband, you know, I was praying for him, but it was over and beyond what I would ever expect. Yeah, yeah. On the, on, so in that climate, yeah. Um, I was 12 years old. I was sitting um, um, alone on my front stoop, and there was a big mimosa tree in the backyard, in the front yard. And is this in Florida? Or? No, this is in New York. Oh, I'm New also York. from New York. This oh, is Long okay. Island. Oh, yeah. oh okay, yeah. And um, and the um, light was streaming um, through the branches of the mimosa tree, on um, and I closed my eyes, and then suddenly the light with my eyes closed was brighter than bright. Hmm. And there was a sense of internal warmth hmm. and just an infused knowledge that I knew God was real. He was all in everything hmm. and I was part of it. Hmm. And he was love and that he loved me hmm. beyond anything I could understand. Wow. And he also, like Frank had the, the experience where he, you know, the desire to go to daily mass mm -hmm. and then knew that that would be honored. He put in me a burning desire to get confirmed in the Catholic Church. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah, yeah. And so I, um, I then uh, talked to my mom and I said I wanted to get confirmed and uh, she was not interested. On and so the girl who did not speak uh, went through the yellow pages, <laughs> picked up the phone, and I called the diocese. Wow, that on. takes something. It's scary for me to call the diocese. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, wow, it that's was, that's, that's, that's so such a real strong. grace. Yeah, this yeah. At age twelve. Was, <laughs> at age twelve, the experience was so strong. Yep. I was also in speech therapy and remedial um, classes because since I didn't speak or make eye contact, they thought I was stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, wow. I call up and I end up talking to a, a, a nun, a sister, um, who ran the education program oh, yeah. for the diocese. And she told me, 
you're in luck. We just started these confirmation classes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're being held in people's homes, and mm -hmm. I could get you into one. So I was thrilled, and I begged my mom to take me, and she did. Mm -hmm. And I went to this woman's house, and there's about a half a dozen of us sitting um, in a circle in her living room. And I, when we were done, I went into my mom's car and I was thinking, I really loved talking about God mm. on, and that experience. And as soon as I got in the car, my mother said, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm not taking you. Mm. On, and I, you know, so I really wanna do this mom. And she's like, I don't care. Wow. And so, the girl who was in all remedial classes again calls up and talks to the sister. Mm -hmm. And then the um, I told her the situation. I said, I can't get to the classes. I said, but now I have the book and the workbook. Mm -hmm. Can I do an independent study? Mm -hmm. And uh, she allowed me to do that. Oh, yeah, wow. And that's that's how I got confirmed. Yeah, okay. So so that, that experience you had of God's love coming into you and what people from the outside would be a, say a hopeless situation that how could somebody ever recover from all that? Somehow God's love coming into your soul and then the desire to confirmation kind of put you on a path to healing? D pure joy. Yeah. Pure joy. On, and, and having on, you know, and I've, heard, I've had different circumstances throughout my, my life where things have been hard or yep. been treated unfairly in different yep. situations. And I've actually had people say, I don't understand you. You, No matter what happens, you give back peace, you give back joy. Yeah, you yeah, know? that's and the way of Jesus, I, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, then I tell them about my, my secret, <laughs> <laughs> which is not so much of a secret and should be a secret. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of puts you on a path despite difficulties remaining and continuing mm -hmm. to come to everybody as who lives on earth you kind of stabilized in your human life and your Christian life and yeah. Well, the the story sort of continued because at 12 I couldn't make it to church. Yeah. So um, God picked me up again at 15 mm -hmm. on and uh, there was a girl, the, I was a sophomore, she was a senior in high school. I, barely knew her, her name was Carol, um, but she knocked me, tapped me on the shoulder on, when I was at my locker and invited me to an Antioch retreat. Oh yeah. Yeah, peer-to-peer yeah. um, -peer on a Catholic uh, retreat. And it was being held at the parochial school. On, and so I turned around and said yes. Um, I think we both almost fell down and I went to that retreat and I really did not know much about the faith other than the very basic stuff yeah. that I got in that class. God exists and he loves me. Yes, basically. Yeah. It was it was a paperback with the, just a lot of pictures and yeah. there wasn't a lot of deep learning. And so uh, there were about 70 kids on that retreat, mm -hmm. the Antioch retreat when I was 15. And they told us about a little room that um, had the tabernacle in it. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about Eucharistic adoration. I didn't really know or understand the real presence at that point sure. either. I, my knowledge was very, very limited. Yeah. And so during lunch one day, I felt this urge, this pull to go to the um, uh, this chapel and I did, and I sat down, I walked in not knowing what to do. There were no chairs, just a little table. It was a tiny room, like a little closet room. And I sat down Indian style on the shared carpet, that dates me, on, and I just looked up at the tabernacle. And again, there was a vision of light. Mm -hmm. And I knew God was not only real, but he was real in the presence in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And I even exclaimed, you're real. Yeah, yeah, I know, um, that's really something, yeah. And at that moment, I also believe God gave me a voice. And to speak so, yeah. on and to uh, to sing, I also sing. Um, yeah. And so that's that's been the, the the backbone, the the, the launch of uh, that's That's really wonderful, you know. Um, 
we're going to have to have you on next week, too, because we want to hear the rest of the story. But this has been really beautiful, just hearing how God's worked in both your lives. And I'm wondering, we only have like a couple minutes left. I wonder if you could just say something directly to the people watching. Maybe anybody who's in the same situation you were as a little girl and give them some kind of encouragement or hope. So I would say that um, God sees us. And, um, you know, when Matthew was a tax collector and he was there doing what he was doing on um, disdained and, and unnoticed by others, God saw him, Jesus saw him, and he called him. So right where we are, whatever we're doing, whatever situation, God sees you, he knows you, and he loves you, and he's beckoning you. So all you have to do is just sit and be still and be silent and listen. Amen. That's so that's beautiful, Rose. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the story next week. I've written a booklet called Join the Resistance. And one of the things that just has come to mind is St. Ignatius of Loyola says, discouragement is never from the Lord. It always needs to be resisted. So I'd like to talk to any of you who are discouraged today. Resist that discouragement and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Resist the lies of the devil. Resist the temptations. Resist the temptation to despair, even to suicide. Resist the lies of the devil. Jesus says the devil is the father of lies that are murderer. No good will come from listening to the lies of the devil, whether it's coming from your own soul, coming from the world, or coming directly from him. So we'd like to make this booklet available to you so you can join the resistance and resist the evil that's trying to engulf your soul and, and, and take you away from the freedom of joy that comes from living in the love of God in a daily way. So until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Dr. Frank and Rose wishing you the very best a life lived in the light and love of Jesus Christ. Join the resistance. I'm only talking about resisting one thing, the lies of the devil working through our corrupt culture that are intended to drag us and the whole human race to ruin. There's no way of explaining the radical changes in our culture and even in our church without recognizing the work of the evil one. This booklet identifies some of the main lies we encounter and gives us tools to recognize and resist them. The scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So ground yourself ever more deeply in the personal love of Jesus and the absolute truth of his teaching. Ask him for the courage and wisdom needed. And from that place of trust and confidence, join the resistance. <laughs>